I hope you will agree with me that this theme um, is relevant to all of us increasingly, and especially to our students, and well worth having a broad overview, which I hope we will be having from Charlotte, who will now take us back to the future, rediscovering classics in a digital world. I'll get rid of the bus slides. Cool. Thank you very much. I think what I'd better do is go offline, because one of the things about collaborative working is that people suddenly uh, put things on your machine without you knowing that they've done it. Uh, let's see if I can just um, escape for a minute. And Oh, well, never mind. You won't mind if l lots of lovely uh, images appear. At the end of the day, the team is busy uploading stuff. Um, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Um, this uh, conference, as you know, has been extremely well organized and uh, with a long, careful planning period. And so I was invited to uh, give this paper quite some time ago. And as you know, also, this tends to be the conference season. Um, there's another conference taking place tomorrow which is the first ever meeting of the Digital Classics Association. It's taking place in Buffalo, New York. And when they asked me if I could attend, and I had regretfully to say no, my regret was rather tempered because I thought the problem about Buffalo, New York in April was that it would be cold and snowing. <laughs> I was actually going to show you the forecast for Buffalo, New York. I think it wouldn't be kind to do so, but it's sunny and nine degrees. <laughs> we may have got that all slightly wrong. Um, I was, when this project to uh, set up something called a Digital Classics Association was suggested, when this lecture on digital classics was suggested, there's a bit of me that feels quite uncomfortable because I think that one of the things that I most regret that has been happening during my professional life uh, since Alan and I were students together um, is the fragmentation of classics. It's always seemed to me that the really, really important thing about classics is that it should be in the round. That a classical education, uh, more than almost any other arts discipline, is about history, philosophy, language, literature, archaeology, every possible route by which the ancient world can be explored. And it seemed to me a bit worrying during my career that there's an increasing tendency for people to describe themselves as part of a subset. It's partly driven by the shape of the degrees that we now offer. And so there can very often be quite a gap between the ancient historians and the philologists or whatever they choose, whatever the literary group to choose to call themselves, the archaeologists or are they going to call themselves the art historians, it will be different in every institution. But there is a worrying tendency towards fragmentation and I think it would be extremely regrettable if uh, the development of digital classics further accentuated that process. In fact, what I, 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 we are right at the beginning of something. And what my hope for a digital world is that digital classics may offer us what is my um, major ambition, which is to return us to the classics of about 1840. I would strongly recommend that as a destination in 1840, when Leake is working on um, in some trans transcriptions, one scholar goes to Turkey, makes some transcriptions, gives them to somebody else who he thinks will publish them more effectively. Um, then uh, he 
Leek publishes them briefly and then sends them off to Professor Burke in an envelope, which I have, which says Professor Augustus Burke, Berlin, um, uh, to include in the big new corpus that he's building there. Uh, a kind of sharing which is not so common nowadays. There's rather more of a tendency for people to want to hold on to my stuff. And a sort of easy, relaxed communication between individuals. Um, and just at the top, to delight you, that is the handwriting of Louis Robert, to whom eventually the uh, Institute in Berlin handed on this, uh, the Academy in Berlin gave him these papers to, to work on. Um, and so we have the typical kind of notebook annotation um, of a traveller in the early 19th century. And that's another aspect that one wants to recall. This man was actually an architect. He'd gone out to make architectural drawings, but he didn't think that that meant that he wasn't qualified to copy the text that he saw on the buildings. So he had a everything's possible kind of view, which again, specialisation can undermine. The Robert's, you just saw Robert's handwriting um, in, uh, on that letter. Um, one of the things that has, of course, happened since 1840 is that we, that our standards of what we think is acceptable publication have certainly developed. We don't necessarily produce more profound commentaries than Augustus Burke did when he was publishing the corpus of Greek inscriptions. We, none of us hope to outdo Mommsen but we have a wider range of material on which to draw. And we are, uh, and Robert's contribution, uh, though it had its drawbacks, to uh, the study of epigraphy was that he was infinitely more demanding about the scale and range of scholarship that somebody working on inscriptions should use. And that has been very inspiring, though rather frightening. It's frightening for the scholar trying to get it right. It also presented uh, practical problems. I was lucky enough to work in Turkey at the very rich site of Aphrodisias uh, from the early 70s uh, until 1994. I worked there with Joyce Reynolds. And we found ourselves, therefore, responsible for a corpus of about 1,500 texts, or rather more. You will be surprised to learn that if you have a corpus of 1,500 texts with full commentaries and several photographs of each, that the enthusiasm of publishers is muted you might have thought they would have been queuing round the block. But they don't see this as the future airport novel. <laughs> and my first disc early on, I realised that it was actually that if this was going to be published, our materials were going to be published on paper, we would have to make major compromises. But we had had the unique opportunity of seeing this material, of recording it, of being there. Lots of it's been lost even during the period that we were working. This is what happens with archaeological sites. We had a duty to that material. How could we fulfil the duty which had been imposed on us by the privilege of access? And I think that is one of the ways that one ought to think about the publication of ancient materials. We're the privileged ones, and that privilege comes with a duty. So my first reason for foraying into the possibility of digital publication was simply questions of space. Where can I put quite so much information? Um, now, 
when I was starting, we stopped excavating, uh, uh, we ceased to be responsible for the inscriptions in 1994. And so it was during the 90s that I was looking for ways of um, publishing this material, which of course meant raising money, and I kept on applying to people and they kept on turning me down. And then I went to my colleague Dominic Rathbone and he crossed out all the possibly and maybe bits of my application and said, you know, wrote that text which says this is the most important thing that has ever been invented since the humankind, and I got the money. But, but the important thing about that is that I was very fortunate in my delay. The, one of the things that it's difficult to grasp, really, is quite how quickly things have been happening. Back in the 1990s, back, back in, before the 1990s, it was, there were several classicists who saw the potential of these wonderful new computers. Um, and, of course, most strikingly, it was um, uh, an, a real computer ban... David Packard, who had also studied classics, who was the person who first started building the TLG, for which, if you remember, he had to invent a whole special font, and you would go along and you could get it printed out on bits, your query results, printed out on great streams of computer paper. It's very, very hard to remember how, how that was. He had, he started collecting texts as early as the 1970s. Um, the, they first produced material on magnetic tape. From 1985, they were producing, do you remember CDs? <laughs> Cast your mind back. I, do you, like me, have a drawer full of dead CDs? Or do you use them for scaring the birds, as quite a lot of people do? Quite often see them strung up across allotments, scaring the birds off. I mean, probably very effective. Um, and uh, Packard also started a collection of um, inscriptions, Greek inscriptions, which is uh, the PHI disc, which came out in 1987. Um, at the same time... Uh, in, at, ab at about the same period, uh, Greg Crane and the, tree, the uh, various people in the Boston area, but focused on Tufts, were thinking about literary and texts and, and classical artifacts, about, again, about how to use these, this potential. Um, and they started planning in 1985. And they, too, started by producing CDs. And who remembers Hypercard? That all of these programs which have come and gone, and actually if you missed them, you don't need to worry. Um, the, in fact, in Latin, there was a rather more random process because in Latin, there was no problem about fonts. So lots and lots of people set up rather random databases here and there of stuff in Latin, because stuff in Latin is easy. The Hellenists were slightly more rational only because they had to be, uh, because until the early 2000s, it was not, Unicode did not exist for ancient Greek. Um, uh, Latin inscriptions were put online, it started being put online in Rome, in Heidelberg, in Frankfurt, and in Eichstätt, and several of those co collections were digitizing exactly the same stuff as one another, which was the drawback about the, the Latinists are rather, always rather wild, you know, and independent. Um, <laughs> but at this stage, you still have a controllable entity. A CD is a thing. And however much it may or may not have cost you to produce it, you can control, at least at the first stages, you think you can control its sale and spread. Um, the, the interesting thing about the Perseus project is that unlike the other two, it, although it took a database format, it described itself as a library. The TLG and the, P the other concept projects were mostly constructed in order to enable you to search. That was the principal function. That was what computers did. They searched things. 
And therefore, a lot of sites were designed with that as a principal purpose. And a lot of them were databases. But the library concept was also beginning to emerge. And so the great Latin uh, corpus project uh, was first uh, planned from 1991. If you remember, also in the 1990s, you could sometimes buy a book which had a CD in the back of the bulkier information. But it was just kind of a way of holding lots of stuff. Um, And the, the concept of a library is an important one because actually you do rather more with a library than just hold a lot of stuff. So the next step was when things went online. Perseus went online in 95. Uh, The Epigraphische Datenbank in Heidelberg uh, went online in 97. That had been invented in the 80s by Geyser Alfoldi. Um, The TLG went online in 2001. These dates are not very long ago. The... PHI went online in 2006. But as I say, they do, they are all, they were mostly projects which had been invented with one concept in mind and where the, the online possibility simply came and arrived and absorbed projects which had not originally been designed for that purpose. And uh, that a lot of what's taking place in the moment is an adjustment of projects from one purpose to another. So when I wanted to, I finally got my grant in 2000, which was just the right timing. And I went along to Oxford and talked to the study for the Centre of uh, the Centre for the Study of Ancient Documents, and they were just launching on the publication of the wonderful Vindolander tablets. Now that's an example of a paper publication which was then put online. Um, and they, I said to them, "What do we do? I don't want to make a database. No, no, you don't want to make a database. They quite agreed. I don't want to make a database because texts are not data. Discuss." But I do not think that text should be treated as data. You can't put text in little boxes. Um, And so they introduced me to a wider world. They introduced me to the fact that other people had been thinking about questions like this while while we hadn't noticed. They introduced me to something called extensible markup language, which is a worldwide three, uh, a uh, worldwide web um, uh, product, part of the Berners-Lee vision for how the web should work. That you should put information up there in standard formats which can be used in a standard way where information, bodies of information can talk to one another because they have used standard formats. I love this slide. What is wrong with this picture? It's so old fashioned. It's about five years old. The missing item there, I think, is the tablet. But, I mean, look at that telephone. (laughs) And we've forgotten about the PDA. It's gone without a trace, leaving only a BlackBerry behind. The bit along the bottom hasn't changed at all. Um, But the idea is that you prepare your material to be delivered in a whole load of different formats. You do the work once, and you then decide how to deliver it. Um, We discovered, I discovered, that lots of people have been thinking about this, particularly for literary texts, for historical texts, that one didn't have to, there was no need to invent a wheel. And moreover, I was lucky enough to have my work coincide with the emergence of a schema for specifically for ancient documents, inscriptions, especially fragmentary ancient documents, called Epidoc. And what I think is most interesting about this slide is that Epidoc is described not as a way of doing things. It is the noun used to describe it. This is an international collaborative effort. 
It is viewed as a group of people doing something. That's quite a different way of thinking. That's not about things belonging to people. And it's that kind of attitude that I find most stimulating in all of this. So anyway, we went ahead publishing our material using Epidoc so that we could test how Epidoc worked and Epidoc could be improved by working on real material. Uh, we worked, we produced our first volume in 2004. We gave it an ISBN. It's extremely challenging to get librarians to catalogue something they haven't paid for. Well, I mean, you have a process, and it either starts with an invoice or it starts slightly further down the line, rather more, less interestingly, with a book. But if you haven't got a physical object they can hold and you haven't got an invoice, how on earth are they supposed to catalogue it? Um, it's worth considering there's absolutely no reason why this shouldn't be in the catalogue of every single institution um, represented here. When you get back, do check whether it is. Um, and it resolved immediately the problem of capacity. We could put in as much data as we wanted to, as many images as we wanted to, as much information as we wanted to. Um, uh, we then published the uh, larger corpus of the inscriptions of Aphrodisias, which one of the ben benefits of that was that we were able to publish it, everything that we had ready. Uh, Joyce Reynolds is still working on some more texts, that doesn't matter. They can be added painlessly to the collection of texts. They will automatically be indexed or whatever. The indices and things will all expand to accommodate them. You don't have to wait till the last letter Z has been completed, like all those encyclopedia and dictionary projects that we know so well, which only ever get to about the letter N. Uh, you can offer, what I find very attractive is that you can offer your user lots and lots of ways of dealing with the, with the material. They don't have to go in in a linear fashion. Uh, you can create, have whatever indices you want. But what I would say is that it's not particularly easy encoding stuff in XML. And it has taken me, uh, I realized that the familiarity of the experience was that it was most similar to writing your Latin prose. It was about taking your meaning and translating it into a language with, uh, with a minimum of distortion. Now, that is something that it was not about the sort of skills you learn with modern language acquisition, which are about expression. It was about what we teach in the most conventional form of classics, which is, here is a body of thought... Here is a language. I am going to transfer that body of thought into this language. You can't beat a classical training if you want to go into software engineering. Uh, the latest uh, publication in Epidoc uh, just came out uh, in 2012 um, and is a very, very important uh, example of how inscriptions ought to be published, I think. Um, the same approach is being used for papyri, and what's interesting here is that a whole group of people, various databases had been set up in the old days of the database in various places in the world, and uh, with the uh, energetic leadership of Roger Bagnall, they pulled it all together into a single resource, which is now extremely useful and which is growing. Uh, and everything's growing. If you don't already, you should subscribe to the Ancient World Online. Every day you will get an email, it's pretty horrifying, telling you how many more things are available online. I'm writing a bibliography at the moment, and I'm trying to give the, the details of every publication if it is available online. Well, it keeps on changing, because more and more things are. Um, you should join Digital Classicist, our own homegrown institution. But there is all this stuff. The internet is about stuff, loads and loads of stuff. And everybody's wittering on about how to prepare children to use the internet, as if the important thing to do was to get them to use Word or explain to them about Facebook. Well, you hardly have to do that. But what you do have to do more than ever before in the history of education 
is teach critical judgment. People now are deluged with information more openly than they ever have been. And the single thing they most need to know is how to assess information when it's thrown at them. Now, what do we teach in classics but that? We spend our whole time assessing sources and assessing the information that people in the past have chosen to give us. Again, I think a classical education becomes more essential than it has been for a long time. Right, well, we return to Joyce's work, just to catch up with what we're on dealing with now. We we return to Joyce's work. Uh, Joyce has just celebrated her 94th birthday. Um, There is no limit. The digital world is not the uh, province of the young, just in case you thought it was. Um, When we republished her inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania, that showed how this kind of project lends itself to collaboration. Um, we, with the photographs and with the maps, which are based on the online Pleiades Gazetteer, and also, uh, so we've superimposed her handwritten map on Google Earth, we also prepared the text in such a way that they could go in automatically, uh, with a minimum of effort, into the Epigraphshire Darton Bank, which is where people go and look for things. So there's a two-way process, bringing information in and pushing information out. Um, And this is the kind of process which is both allowing much easier communication and collaboration between scholars and breaking down the barriers between the bits of classics precisely the kind of things that can take us back to the 1840s. Um, The model example of this is the Pelagios project um, here in the UK, largely, uh, where they're using geography to link information. It's a very good place to start. So if you go to one of our pages and you see that we're now working on the Saranacan inscriptions and you see that there is a reference to Pleiades, you can click on it. You, uh, there is a, you can click on the name of Cyrene. You get offered a map. That's normal enough. But you also get references to every other academic publication which has used the same reference. So you can immediately go to the sculpture or the uh, lexicon of Greek personal names or wherever it is that has linked into this. It's an opening. That beats the normal footnote. Um, And you can do it. They've produced a widget so that you can insert it in your own blog. I'm assuming everyone here has a blog. And there is no excuse for you're not using the Pelagios widget. The trouble is, you can't escape. Digital publication should be of a higher standard than paper publication because it hasn't got the excuses of the logistical difficulty of delivering information. The other aspect of digital classics, of of, of the digital world for us, is can we do new things? Now, what we're doing at the moment is working on a project which has to be finished this summer. We're interested in collections of sayings, uh, both in Greek and in Arabic, which have been very carefully, kindly marked up by the scribe. Each saying starts with, he said, and it's been rubricated. Um, we are working to develop a stand with, with scholars everywhere to develop a sca- standard collection of statements that you can make about any two pieces of text. And we want all the help that we can get from all the philologists in the room. Uh, if we can get this right and develop a language of talking about the relationships between text, this is full of potential. We can talk about, we have new ways of talking about the relationships between manuscripts, uh, between statements, and we can represent those relationships in new and different ways, simply more complex than we could express in words. 
it's just too difficult to say all those things. But all kinds of interrelationships emerge. It's particularly interesting for me in my medieval hat. Um, my challenge at the moment is that while I'm building a corpus which uh, wants to express relationships, the number of digital texts online to which I can connect is still limited. The TLG, for example, because it was set up as a search engine, you can't link to a place in it because it wasn't set up with that purpose. So we, there are very rich resources out there which don't quite fit into the modern, because, hey, that was 1,500 years ago, um, model. Um, the, uh, a few days ago, uh, Greg Crane from Perseus took up his new Alexander Humboldt professorship at Leipzig, where he's got the onerous task of spending 5 million euros, and he is proposing to develop ways of building a network of what he calls open philology, making more texts. I want my collection text to be able to talk to more texts out there. He's working on it. And one of the ways that's going to happen is in the past, in the 19th century, you published an edition then somebody else published an edition, none of them cost a huge amount, which is why it was possible to have lots and lots and lots of editions of the same text. That was how the debate happened, with nasty footnotes in Latin. Um, but now, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, there are ways of working together. Now, humanists become very nervous when you suggest collaboration. But we have actually always done it. It just in a slightly different structure. Uh, the papyrus people have already got a system for contribution and peer review for material which then goes into papyri.info. Uh, the Homer, Homer Multitext, a very interesting project, um, is also allowing people to add data. Here's an example of uh, data from manuscript images because, as you know, they're digitizing all the early Homer manuscripts. Uh, they're doing, the uh, people in Boston are doing some very interesting work on what, on pars, what I would have called parsing, but it's now called tree banking, trying to think, to build a huge body of information about the structure of sentences in Greek and Latin. Um, so, we can build, go back and restore that world of getting together we can give a far wider range of access to what we think is important than has ever been possible before. When I point out that my inscriptions can now be read by students in Turkey or in Libya, I always notice that actually my colleagues couldn't care less. They don't really think it matters. What they really mind about is whether Professor so-and-so sees it. But it is really important, particularly with material that people who live in the countries with the material should have access to the richest possible presentation of that material. It's a completely colonialist model that we have of taking the stuff away. And I think that gradually more and more countries are going to grasp that and are going to demand more access to the stuff that came from their own country. Um, and I think that it is going to build greater concentration on the understanding of the ancient languages. There is also some very interesting work being done on providing more and more online tutorial material. But the real revelation was what happened when the Open University started op offering Latin and Greek. And as you know, they were completely overwhelmed by the take-up. So... The languages are key in all of this, in a discipline where language, language is central to classics and language is central to the digital world. Uh, but we can add new ways of understanding interrelationships, breaking down a lot of barriers which we have to, to logistically, the Arabic book is in a different shelf from the Greek book. It's quite sensible. But there are new ways of dealing with this. 
And above all, we can offer a space where everybody who loves classics, the sort of people who belong to the Classical Association, can share their enthusiasm. Um, and so the real question is, what are you going to do? That's the really important question. I've shown you what lots of other people are doing, but what about you? Um, well, one of the standard academic complaints is the grumble about Wikipedia. Oh, it's all so terrible. Look at Wikipedia. It's all so inaccurate. The scientists are getting out there and correcting the articles on their specialities. They're just going out there and doing it. The only person who doesn't approve is your dean, who thinks that it's a waste of your time because he won't be able to enter it for the REF. That's because he hasn't read the paragraphs on impact, has he? Impact, 20% of the REF this time, 25% of the REF next time. In my view, I hate to say it, a really good thing. It'll take a long time for people to digest it, but I think actually classicists have always known about it. So get out there and correct a Wikipedia article tomorrow. I'll tell you the real giveaway, if you look for cities in Asia Minor, I used to give it to my students to do, look for cities in ancient Mi Asia Minor, the only bit that has been improved with footnotes is the bit when St Paul turns up. <laughs> because some enthusiast has taken the Acts of the Apostles and gone through all the sites and improved it. But all the early stuff is pretty useless. So get out there and improve it. And... Use photographs, especially those of you who took photographs of ancient sites some time ago. Sites which may well have changed substantially. Digitize those images and upload them to the Roman Society uh, data bank of, of images. Get that stuff out there. Don't just hold on to it. It's down to all of us. This is a terrific opportunity, for, but it's not just for a few specialists, and it's not for digital classicists. We are all digital now, as Richard Nixon would have said. <laughs> Thank you.